I'm going to start today with a question for you. <clears throat> um, what are the most valuable commodities in society today? And I think many of you might be thinking along the lines of what you see there, but um, really the most valuable commodity is you, your attention. The amount of time and effort that people put into making sure that you um, are listening to them, buying what you want them, uh, what they want you to buy, and going where you want to go is tremendous. And the fact that you're here, uh, when you could be on the internet, you could be watching a movie, you could be shopping, you could be sleeping, um, I really want to thank you for doing that because by being here, you're learning, you're going to probably share what you've learned, and that might help protect the Marine Sanctuary for Future Generations. So uh, first, I want to thank you for the precious resource of your attention. <clears throat> um, what I'm going to be talking about today is not just about my research, but it's real teamwork. Um, here along the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, uh, here, here are, oh, they don't really show on that. Um, you can see the borders of the sanctuary go from up near San Francisco all the way to the bottom of the Big Sur coastline and then we have this area of Davids and Seamount. All of those dots and numbers are different research institutions around the bay. And so uh, even though we have a huge charge at the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary to understand everything happening out there, seeing how it's changing through time, we have a huge number of partners to work with. And so our research is really a team effort. Here's just a small part of the group that was doing the deep sea research. Uh, that I'm going to be talking about, but there's additional ones as well. So why are we going to be talking about the deep sea? Um, many of us think that the terrestrial environment is where most, of, most things live, but the living space on this planet is largely in the deep sea, and this is from ground level to one kilometer up, the bottom of the sea to one kilometer up. You can see this area here is... Uh, really the dominant area where things live and there are things that we don't really know that much about uh, we should be studying um, to understand it so we can take care of it that's why we're going to be focusing on the deep sea today so the areas I'm mostly going to be talking about in the Monterey Bay sanctuary in the deep sea are research we've done at Davidson Seamount and this area here called Sur Ridge um, uh, where the depths range from 4,000 feet deep to about 12,000 feet deep. So the shallowest spot is 4,000 feet deep. It's completely black, dark, and it's close to freezing in these areas. I want to tell you that we're part of a national program, just one slide. Um, it's not just the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. We're a federal program, and we have sanctuaries um, around uh, the United States and terrestrial waters. So the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how technology has advanced uh, in the deep sea from when I started working at the sanctuary to now, been a little over 20 years, some recent discoveries, uh, marine conservation biology issues uh, that some of the students here might be familiar with, and then opportunities associated with the deep sea about maybe how you might get involved uh, or participate in some activities. So here I am when I started the job at the sanctuary about 1997. And rather than these nice blue maps seeing the bottom, all we had was this. And it told you the fathoms, you know, six feet length, uh, how deep things were. And we could go down in the submarine and um, look through one of the portholes, uh, laying down on your stomach. The pilot was sitting on a stool. And it had uh, one, one pipe holding the stool that was between your legs. And you'd be laying down with a camera, and they'd tell you, don't worry, there's a leak around the propeller, but it should be fine. And, um, and so I get, we'd get things like a plane went down here. What were the impacts of the resources? Uh, tell us, Andrew. And I'd like, OK, I know somebody who took some trawls there. Let me talk to Jim Nybakken. Uh, but from there, uh, we've been able to use uh, multi-beam and side-scan sonar to give nice maps of the deep sea. Um, many people think it's just a nice smooth area as your beach continues down, but we have canyons, uh, we have ridges, we have seamounts, and we were able, also able to start uh, 
uh, taking samples on the seafloor and seeing, okay, where is it hard bottom, where is it rocky bottom, because that really defines a lot about what lives down at the bottom of the sea. Then, uh, in the early 2000s, with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, we were able to use remotely operated vehicles to study the, the deep sea. We were able to go down, you know, uh, 4,000 to 12,000 feet deep and be the first human eyes to ever see what was living on the seafloor. It's pretty exciting. And only 70 miles away, but nobody had ever looked there because there wasn't the technology. And so we had this cabled, remotely operated vehicle, no more laying on your stomach, wondering how long you can hold your bladder to get to the surface. You're nice and comfortable on top of the ship. And these are some of the first areas we went on Davidson Seamount. And we saw amazing things. Uh, we saw fish like that, um, uh, like this one down here. It's a type of angler fish, never been seen before. They put out a lure. They have fins like feet. And when they're young, they're blue. And as they get older, they turn red. So there's one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish of Dr. Seuss. Somehow he knew, though he'd never seen that, and we saw the first live specimen. We found uh, sponges this big, never been described before. Uh, could have some uh, apl applications for medicine. Uh, whale falls, where whales sink to the bottom of the sea, and we can see all the things that grow on them. In fact, there's about six species of worms that only grow on whale bones. Um, and they have to find their way from one carcass to the next. Uh, big corals, uh, as large as I am. And um, I'll go a little bit from the, the sea surface down to the bottom. Uh, well, the midwater near the top of it. Um, newly described species, big red. It's about the size of a basketball. Swimming jellies. This thing here, um, the scientists on the ship didn't even know what phylum it was in. Turns out to be a sea slug that can also fly. Um, on the crest, um, big sponges. We found a new predatory sponge. Usually fun sponges filter water. This one would pierce uh, small animals and consume them. Uh, Bubblegum corals, they now have some models of these at the Deep Sea Aquarium, the new exhibit. Um, on the slope, the sides of the seamount, we have had these creepy bobbing heads. Turns out to be a tunicate. Actually, more related to human beings than any of the other animals you're seeing here. This sponge is the size of a sofa. This one's called the salty lizard fish, the halosaur, uh, black corals. Just amazing things that we see in the deep sea because we had this new technology of remotely operated vehicles. Um, but those you can only, it's like driving. If you can imagine when we go up the side of the sea mount, it'd be like sitting here, driving up to Lake Tahoe and describing everything you see in the headlights. You really don't have a big view of things and you really have a very narrow path that you're following. So we started pulling this uh, camera sled, which we could move much more rapidly over the seafloor. The quality of the images weren't that great, but we could cover areas and see things like um, these brachiopod beds, these ancient animals that look like clams uh, that will cover certain areas of the seafloor. <clears throat> Uh, then technology advanced more um, with uh, developing remotely uh, uh, autonomous underwater vehicles. They don't have to be on a cable. They're going out to sea uh, where they've been programmed to go. Uh, they're collecting all sorts of mapping data, taking water samples, and they could give you uh, fine scale mapping of the seafloor that you could then put a remotely operated vehicle on so it knows where it is and it won't bump into things. And corals like this, which is live, we now have maps of the seafloor that looks like this. These aren't pictures. These are actual maps. So we've gone from here's 80 fathoms to this is what the coral looks like at this spot, right, done by this mapping. Uh, if we are at 8,000 feet and we mark some things with a little lead ball, we can come back a week later and go right back to it. <clears throat> so with all of that information and all of those images, we can start answering questions. You, you go out and look at the ocean and you see blue. I look, I, uh, go out and I look at the ocean and I see all of these different zones of military activity, uh, fishing activity, special conservation areas. And when decisions have to be made about these things, you want good seafloor and biological information. And we now know what the seafloor looks like at the bottom. We have images at all these red dots. 
and we're much, uh, much more prepared to answer resource management questions now than before. <clears throat> Another new technology, maybe not so new to all of you now, but um, uh, it's, it's uh, within the last few years, is using environmental DNA. When um, we leave the room, if somebody got murdered, the police would come in here and start sweeping up the DNA, and they'd say, yeah, he was there, he's got, he's got a record, you know, we're going to follow up on this guy. Uh, but it turns out when animals are swimming through the ocean, <clears throat> their, their uh, DNA uh, will, will, uh, will be left behind either through metabolic waste, they lose some tissue, uh, um, different scales. And so we can go to an area of the ocean and take a water sample. <clears throat> Here we've taken some water samples on Sur Ridge, one of these deep areas. And we can tell you what has swim by, uh, been swimming by that area or what's close to that area just based on that water sample. You collect it, you filter it, you replicate the DNA, and then you compare it to a gen bank. And so from these water samples here, we knew that this squid was coming by. There, there are uh, sponges nearby. Uh, the humpback whales have been swimming in the area. And that's another form of technology that's going to help us understand what's living in the sea because we're supposed to manage it for future generations, and how can you do that if you don't even know it's living there? Right? Okay, um, the remotely operated vehicle work that we did <coughs> at Sur Ridge is something that's now becoming more common as that technology becomes more available. But people will often go to an area, describe it, and move on. And what we've liked to do is at Sur Ridge, is develop what we're calling our deep sea coral observatory, where we don't just note what's living there, we understand the conditions around it. Done a lot of work uh, on that from Ambari's Western Flyer, where in, in addition to just describing the animals, we look at what are the, the currents um, uh, 30 feet, 100 feet above them, what are the currents right around the animals we're studying, uh, these cones collect the uh, marine snow, the marine debris that, f that drifts down from the, uh, the midwater to feed these animals. And then we've also set up cameras so that we can not just visit once and leave, but leave the camera behind so it's taking pictures uh, over a series of months and we can kind of see the interactions happening there. And with this kind of technology, uh, we've been able to study on Davidson Seamount um, uh, a, uh, a deep sea octopus uh, brooding garden. And uh, our first expedition to Davidson Seamount made it so exciting that it was added to the sanctuary. It wasn't there before. We did it mostly for the corals, but then we found out that um, at about 10,000 feet, there are thousands of these octopus that no one had ever seen before, and they're brooding and releasing their young and it just happened to be protected in an area that we protected for corals. So here are some of these things we've learned about these deep sea octopus. Um, we set up one of our cameras, took pictures uh, every 20 minutes for six months of Mus octopus robustus, which is what, what that, that thing is. These are all females. They're upside down, there are eggs underneath them and they're protecting and fanning their eggs. Um, they're there for 600 days um, on top of their eggs. Um, and then when they hatch, the females die. Now what's interesting, we learned that they're there for 600 days. We also learned that they're there partly because the water's slightly warmer. There are other deep sea octopus that'll brood their eggs for four years and then die. So they have somehow figured out where the seafloor is a little bit warmer and they can uh, more rapidly um, brood their eggs. Then we have these anemones right nearby and there's little shrimp. So the kinds of things that we've seen in these images is there are anemones right nearby and why are they there? They probably want to eat something. Uh, when these eggs hatch and you see this little uh, octopus leaving, the anemones are grabbing for them. These scientists that are very, um, uh, you know, clinical, we're studying science, they're rooting for these, these little octopus. It's been, you know, 600 days. Yeah, it got away. Uh, or dang it, it got eaten. That was a lot of work. Um, 
So they're, they're there. Here you can see a male coming in uh, to mate with a female. The males also uh, die after they mate. We don't know where they are when they're not here and where they go, but we do know that they die. Um, for some reason, this female here uh, died before her, her eggs hatched. So the eggs were exposed. And in a short amount of time, we saw these scavengers, these the snails come in and little shrimp, and in no time at all, they're gone. Um, but then another female uh, comes right into that same spot. And then, uh, while well, that's kind of life starting over again, here is a, a dead octopus that happened to drift into this anemone, and it's getting a nice meal. So that's what's happening um, in the deep sea. Um, these things, we're just touching the surface of what we know about what's happening in the deep sea, and yet we're impacting it in many ways. So um, we are impacting it. The scientists know that we're impacting it. Unfortunately, we're not really good at explaining it and changing the way the world operates. Uh, this is a quote by Gus Speth. Um, he has been working on environmental uh, uh, conservation science for many years, and he used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. And he figured at 30 years of his work, all these problems would be addressed, but he was wrong because the top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, apathy, and I would argue ignorance too. Um, we know what's happening there, but how do you change the way society works? And he thinks to deal with those, we need spiritual and cultural transformation. People that know how to change the world, you know, people, people that can, can envision everybody should have a computer at their desk and make that happen. You know, we need people like that. And scientists aren't necessarily those, those people. So there might be people in, in the room like you uh, that might take on that role. So here are some of the problems that we have in the deep sea. Um, this is called the Keeling Curve, and it shows the amount of atmospheric uh, CO2 that is affecting our climate uh, that's been measured uh, since the 58 to, to today, just going up and up. And as it is going up, a lot of that CO2 is being absorbed by the ocean, and the ocean is becoming more acidic, right? So we're, and the deep sea is more acidic than the surface. And so we are affecting the deep sea before we even really know what's happening. Um, there's also uh, deep sea mining uh, that's being proposed to collect things like these manganese nodules. Um, deep sea mining, there are actually areas in the Pacific that have been designated and leased for certain countries to operate in. Um, they haven't started doing the mining yet, but they've tested some machines like this one uh, on a ship that will be crawling along the seafloor, um, pulling up. Uh, these manganese nodules and then releasing their plumes of, uh, of what's left uh, here in the midwater where they're, where they're probably going to be floating forever. You know, it's not just um, a, a month or a few weeks. And that's going to affect the, um, the ability for midwater species to feed. It's going to affect um, uh, the, how they communicate with bioluminescence. And some scientists are starting to think about this, like, this could be a problem, so maybe we could extend these all the way to the seafloor so you're not affecting the, the midwater. But there's a lot of other questions to be asked, and uh, that's just one more example of how we're starting to impact uh, the sea before we even really know how it operates. Um, I thought I'd throw this in. These are manganese nodules. Um, once you harvest them, you're not going to harvest them again. The manganese grows a couple mil millimeters every million years. And at the, bay, at the center of these manganese nodules, you'll often find shark teeth, including the extinct uh, megalodon shark teeth at the center of these manganese nodules. So that's just to give an idea of how long it takes uh, for these things to develop. We also do things uh, like spill uh, oil. Um, this is the uh, Deep Horizon oil spill in, um, in the Gulf of Mexico that you probably heard about if you'd been watching the news five years ago or so. And they didn't want the oil to come to the surface, so they projected oil dispersants where the oil was coming out, which just created a blanket along the seafloor. And that blanket 
covered a lot of these deep sea corals, like the ones that I showed you um, in, the, uh, in the beginning of my presentation. So one of the things that we've been working on uh, with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute is methods for restoring deep sea corals, which had never been done before. And then so we're finding ways of collecting branches of corals, ways of bringing them, you know, for 4,000, 5,000 feet deep, keeping them alive, uh, putting them in some sort of pot that we can put back to the seafloor. Uh, these were some of our early uh, tests, uh, seeing if they survive, seeing if they develop eggs. And we've actually um, been successful for probably six out of eight species. And our method is now being used and of interest in the Gulf of Mexico. And here, where there was a, uh, a large uh, structure that sank um, just north of us, um, they're going to have to be using this technique to restore some of the corals. So um, we do have some abilities to learn things. Um, and that's one of, our, uh, one of our solutions to address problems that humans have caused. Um, we also have an issue uh, that's, um, that's, I know Yasmin thinks a lot about, um, and that's, that's uh, plastics in the ocean. Um, so we used to think that plastics were just up at the surface of the sea. Uh, but it turns out, uh, again, another study done by somebody that's now at Scripps and in Bari, uh, they looked at how, how plastic uh, uh, density change with depth. So here you're going shallow to deeper, less to more. And it turns out that there's a lot of plastics um, that are in the midwater area and they're getting all the way to the seafloor. And these are the different kinds of plastics uh, that are making their way into the, into the ocean. Interestingly, things like these filaments, um, they become more common in the near shore in the winter time when all of us are washing our fleece coats. It makes it through the uh, uh, through the wastewater plants and into the ocean. Um, and the, the amount of plastics are just increasing, increasing. The, you can find them in whales. You can find them in almost 100% of some of the, uh, our, our seabirds and shorebirds here. Um, so this was collecting them at the surface, different kinds of plastics, um, remotely operated vehicle. And how do they get to that depth? Plastics should probably float. but. It, there's this interesting animal in the Monterey Bay called a giant larvation. Um, this part, this little worm, is about the size of my finger, and it just kind of wags its tail. But as it does that, it creates this big mucus house. It's very intricate, of many chambers, it's about three feet wide, and it's floating around in the Monterey Bay, filtering, uh, pulling out bits of organic matter that it can feed on, but it's also pulling in uh, the microplastics. And um, these, these animals are so common in the fall in the Monterey Bay that they can, they, can they can filter almost the whole volume of the Monterey Bay in 10 days, right? So, uh, and when their houses get clogged, they just uh, leave them and make a new one, but they sink, right? So that could be one way that plastics um, are brought uh, to the deep sea. But there are, um, there are maybe some solutions to plastics, right? We know that recycling isn't working very well, and people have, plastics are very convenient. There's an interesting work by some scientists in, in Spain that were working on a pest. It's called the, uh, the waxworm that eats the honeycombs of bees, and they're studying them, and they were keeping them in plastic containers, and these guys were eating their way out of them. So somehow they were able to to deal with plastic. They thought it was something's in their stomach. It turns out that their saliva can break down plastics into uh, basic compounds. And uh, there are efforts now to um, synthesize this compound so that uh, we can take plastic waste and break it down. So there's, there's some opportunities there. Um, there's also some interesting work being done on, um, on some uh, bacteria that now make uh, what we're calling bioplastics. Uh, they operate like plastics, but they're made from bacteria. Um, so that's something that we'll be able to break down. And in addition, there's, uh, there's efforts. Uh, we have one of our colleagues at the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, Ryan Friedman, working on this, where you can then 3D print when you make these, and you insert bacteria into the plastic 
so that with time the bacteria will start breaking it down. So there are some, uh, there, there's some innovation that, that could help us with these things that seem like overwhelming problems. Um, when I mention climate change, um, there's an area um, between Morro Bay and Davidson Seamount that has been put up for lease in the last year uh, for putting in uh, wind turbines that are, will create clean energy uh, that they will then put through the Morro, uh, Morro Bay power plant and out on the grid. So that's one way to create clean energy, but you can see there's also gonna be impacts from the, on the seafloor. Um, you know, birds can, can, get, uh, uh, can get hit by these, uh, uh, these different uh, blades, uh, and um, there's gonna be a lot of sound associated, maybe some entanglement of whales. So scientists are working hard to figure out at what height should you put these so that most of the birds migrate underneath them? How can we uh, construct something so that there's less entanglement? So here what we have, what I would call um, a benefit with some concerns, um, and, and you need to find some ways to mitigate. Everything that humans do have some sort of impact, and you socially have to decide what you can live with and what you can't, and it's not always for the scientists to decide. Uh, one of the ways we might address that is through more uh, place-based management like sanctuaries. There's been several efforts to um, protect the seamounts on the west coast. Now there's a, a, uh, an effort to designate the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary uh, down here. But all of you um, might have a role to play in understanding and protecting the ocean for future generations. What can you do? Um, you can make personal decisions, you know. I get, Americans waste 40% of their food. Yeah, maybe you won't waste your food as much. Um, you can vote you know, for candidates that, that care about the environment. You can volunteer. There's a lot of volunteers helping out uh, today in this event, in cleaning up beaches, educating. Maybe you learned some things here that's interesting. You can tell uh, some friends about it. Uh, you can make professional choices in what kind of careers you want for some of the, the younger people. Um, there's always every, I mean, every organization that I've been involved with, there's never enough money. But certainly the sanctuary is one of those. Um, I'm supposed to monitor the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, let you know everything living in there, how it's changing through time, if it's human caused or not. And my budget to do that, zero. Go find some grants, get some donations. Figure it out. So um, then um, this, I think, might be, uh, may, in some ways, maybe the most relevant, is, is let, your, let your elected representatives know that the environment matters to you. I mean, you care about gas prices, um, but they can only focus on so many things. And if, if the environment isn't one or two or three, they're going to be focusing their efforts on other things. Um, and you can't blame them for that because they just have so much time. They just have so many resources. Um, so, you know, if you saw some things during the Whale Fest that you care about and you let your representatives know that you vote based on these things, that's some things that you can do. So thank you very much for the honor of your attention. And I think I have time for a few questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm. You know what makes it warmer? Are there like... Right. Things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a really good question. Um, she wanted to know, why is the water warmer where the octopus are brooding? Um, it's, a, it's a study of um, deep sea geologists. And what you have is you have the seamount, which is made... Uh, it's volcanic. It hasn't erupted in 10 million years, but it's volcanic and the rock is basalt and so water can seep through it. It doesn't really seep through the seafloor that's muddy. It's kind of like when it rains, those ponds form and it sticks. But the water does work its way down through there. It works under the crust and th where the, the mantle of the earth is warm. And then the, the warm water, because uh, it, it rises and it comes through another area that's this volcanic basalt. So we think that when we just found this brooding garden, that if we go to all of the seamounts along the west coast and 
Everybody likes to look at the top because that's where the cool things are. We're going to look off to the side and off a little bit to see if maybe what we think is really unique might be along all of these other seamounts. So, and when I say it's warm, it goes rather than 4 degrees centigrade, it gets up to like 10 degrees centigrade, which is still really cold, <laughs> but makes a big difference. Yeah, I think that that varies uh, species to species, okay. but these, these live longer. And, um, but I, I couldn't even tell you how long they live because when they're done brooding, you know, they die, but where they go, how long it takes them to come back, what they do in the meantime, how they find this place, still a mystery. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, what do you use manganese for? I actually thought someone might ask that, and I was going to look it up, and I didn't. Uh, but I think that um, someone else might know, but, the, but I, I think that we might need them for, like, batteries and industrial uh, things. So, um, you know, that's another one of these things where it's like, okay, uh, we need some of these things for our iPhones. Um, and our batteries, should we take them from land? Should we take them from the deep sea? Uh, can we invent new ways of doing things? Um, you know, it's one of those that, you know, everything has an impact. You want to solve it. You're going to come up with other problems. You know, I have a friend who's, he says, oh, this, all these electric cars and climate change is bogus. This guy got stuck and I had to push him with my truck and he felt really proud of it. And it's like, well, I'm sure when they came out with cars, they got stuck, and the people with horses said, I had to pull that car out. You know, it's, you got to kind of stay, stay ahead of things. Um, yeah? Uh, um, about the e-DNA, DNA, yeah. how long did that footprint last? Like, ah. come back well, swim through, how long? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. how long does it take for the, the DNA to degrade after some things goes by? That is a really important question that hasn't been worked out yet. The other one is, it's like, okay, you can tell it was there. We're, you know, we think maybe two to four days. Um, did it drift over or did it, yeah, did it drift in? And then the other thing is like, okay, was that one whale or 10 whales? Uh, there's still a lot to be worked out there. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you have a comment or something? Yeah. yeah. You talked about how far technology has come since Yeah. Well, you know, to me, I think some of the bigger environmental issues are what to do with plastics and then um, what to do with, uh, with, um, with climate change, you know, uh, with the gases we're, we're releasing into the atmosphere. And, you know, I, I have some hope with the plastics I, that I think that the fossil fuel industry might see that they're shifting away from vehicles and they're focusing more on plastics. But I'm hoping that some of these bioplastics and breakdowns are, are a bit of the future. Um, with, the, with climate change, it's big. You know, I think we can all do our individual parts. We need, I think the government needs to subsidize. You know, I probably, as a no employee, shouldn't say this really, but I, I think they probably need to subsidize um, uh, clean energy like we do fossil fuels um, and, and do more research and then uh, work with industry to figure out supply chains and then once you develop these things, how to make them inexpensive and uh, easily accessible. Some along those lines I would hope to see. Yeah, there's also, we're, we're learning so much more with sound uh, in, in the ocean. Um, it's hard to see everything, but you can listen to a lot. And there's some talks coming up that are gonna be about using sound. I think there's huge, uh, there's a huge future in that, and also the use of drones, uh, either in the water and above land. Uh, right now, you know, we'll go out in these boats and create a lot of uh, gases, you know, but, um, and you can do a survey. It's a lot of work to do surveys at sea with a boat looking for whales, but if you have a fixed wing drone flying back and forth, um, not only can we do it cheaper uh, with less environmental impact, and more frequently, we can then adaptively manage things like, wow, the drone is seeing all these whales over here. Let's have the crab fishery focus over here now so they don't get entangled with the whales. 
and do that sort of on a daily basis. I have high hopes about that. I was kind of wondering about the bioplastics. Yeah. I think that that's the idea. Um, yeah, that's that's the idea and the hope. And I think it's um, uh, yeah. I, I definitely think it's better than we have now. Yeah, that's a really good comment. <laughs> All right. Well, I will be around if anybody wants to talk to me later. But uh, again, thank you so much for being here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Andrew. That was a very interesting talk, so we want to say thank you. With Thank you. And we'll take a couple of minutes break, and then we'll come back with our next speaker.